בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, שבוע טוב, שבוע מבורך, everybody, we are uh, continuing our uh, series of the uh, Jewish Ashkafa, uh, בעזרת השם, uh, based on the uh, Sefer, by the uh, Chazonish, עליו השלום, uh, learning how to think like a Jew, learning how to behave like a Jew, and not what uh, people call, uh, unfortunately, Judaism today, but uh, very, very far from what reality is. Uh, tonight's show will be for a uh, refuah shlema for um, uh, Rav Ephraim ben uh, Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah bat Anat, uh, Rabbanit uh, Levana bat Sarah, David ben Esriya, Doris bat Joa, uh, Joshua uh, ben Noach, uh, Esther bat Zipora, uh, Itro ben Avraham, Talia bat Sarah, Orit bat Ilana, uh, Rivka bat Sara and uh, Tinok ben uh, Rivka and also for a uh, Atzlacha Raba for Ruven Chaim ben Pala Parel uh, Itro ben Avraham um, Talia bat Sara David ben Esriya Oshri ben uh, Doris Gabi ben Doris Elad ben Doris uh, Marsha bat Julie Samuel ben Marsha Sefas ben Marsha Alexander ben Marsha Louis ben Marsha Shaul ben Farzane uh, Alex Ben uh, Noach, also for Refua Shlema for him, and uh, Netanel Yosef Ben Avraham, Kadosh Buchu Yivarechotam, and all of the wonderful Jewish and uh, righteous Noahides that uh, continue to uh, learn Shurim with us, support our uh, hard work, Baruch Hashem, and uh, continue, continue to uh, get closer to our Kadosh Buchu. Uh, so uh, we have a Jewish Ashkafa for the last uh, few weeks. We've been learning uh, the significance of learning uh, both Musar and Alacha, but even more so the Chazonish has uh, elaborated further on the necessity of uh, learning Alacha, where without learning Alacha, you simply will not know how to be a Jew. Uh, and without uh, learning Musar, you simply will not learn how to behave, whether Jew or non-Jew. Uh, this is the reason why uh, Musar is an obligation uh, to learn both for the Jews and the non-Jews because this is to learn ethics, uh, to learn how to behave in accordance to Hashem's will and not necessarily in accordance to what's in the mode because today the mode is unfortunately to desecrate Hashem's name as often as possible uh, and in uh, many cases the desecration of Hashem's name is uh, is coming from people that call themselves uh, rabbis, call themselves uh, uh, scholars in t- in some cases, call themselves uh, people that are trying to do the uh, you know the uh, help Am Yisrael, but in reality, all they're helping Am Yisrael is to get further from Hashem. Now, uh, one of the main things that we learned from Parashat Pinchas is that uh, Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Cohen. He is, uh, was not originally a Kohen, uh, although he was a descendant of, of Aaron a Kohen. Hashem chose for him not to be a Kohen, but he later became not only a Kohen, but a Kohen Gadol and promised to live forever. He, became, he becomes Eliyahu Navi. And the reason why is because of his public rebuke, public protest for somebody desecrating Hashem's name. And from there, the sages teach us is that when somebody rebukes those that are desecrating Hashem's name, those that are going against the will of Hashem, uh, you know, that's where the Torah tells us, or the sages tell us, that those people are actually bringing mercy to the world. Now, for those of you that are watching uh, the, uh, the shiur on the app, on the live feature, it just shut off, and I don't want to break the uh, momentum right now to, uh, to go fix cameras. So I'm sorry it's not working yet. We're still having some technical difficulties. Bezot uh, Hashem, next time will uh, work uh, better. So uh, you can watch it live uh, tomorrow or whatever. Uh, so anyway, uh, the Chazonish has extended the explanation and, and the depth of the necessity uh, of learning Alacha, because that's how you're going to know what the will of Hashem is. But at the same token, told us that, again, learning Allah by itself, learning the law by itself, is not enough, because you need to know how to apply the law. 
And many times you'll see people saying, yeah, this, I think that, you know, the Rambam said this, and the Shukhan Aruch says this, and, uh, you know, and they're relying on the fact, on one case, they're relying on their own memory, which is, they're human, they could fail, but even more so, they're sometimes, if, if, they're, if they're con artists, like some of the people we've mentioned in the past, they're relying on the spiritual laziness of the public, where they're not going to double check some of the things that uh, were said. And uh, for that, I figured last minute, there's other sham. Perhaps we're going to bring some of those pointers for for you, the ones that are seeking a sham, the ones that are seeking the truth, to uh, be rest assured and again be reminded that there, it's not for naught that the biggest rabbis in the world have publicly supported our teachings, have publicly supported our organization. It's not just uh, people like to sign signatures. If people understood what uh, we'd have to go through in order to get uh, any type of public support, you'd understand that most people don't even go for it. And the reason why is because most people simply don't want to be investigated and uh, double-checked for every single little uh, twitch that you've ever made. So when you uh, get a, uh, an investigation by Talmidei Chachamim, when they double-check everything you do for a period of years, not a period of a week or two weeks, but a period of years, and then after that get such lovely letters by one rabbi after another, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it, and uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, we're proud to uh, to uh, show those to the public simply because we know that today there are so many speakers out there, there are so many organizations out there, but many times you will hear uh, things that we say conflict with many of the things that some other people say, but not conflict to the extent where my story is better than their story or their story is better than my story, but rather that the words that we say are literally the opposite to the words that they say to the extent that, that what they're saying is antithetical to Judaism altogether in accordance to the words that we say. Now, of course, we bring you sources in each and every shiul that you can double check. You could, uh, if you haven't checked it, you can go back to the shiulim. They're all posted on the internet and double check each and every single source as many people do, Baruch Hashem. One thing I don't like and I don't appreciate for anyone that's watching the shiulim, I've said this before and I'll say it again, don't ask me why some other rabbi said something. I'm not the compliance department for the, you know, the rabbinical world. You want to ask me why I said something, if it's quoted in my shiul, by Chavod, I'm more than happy to respond for my own reasons, for my own uh, statements. But don't ask me why Rabbi such and such said this in his shiul. That's his problem. Go ask him. Go ask him. Go ask them why they said what they said. And, uh, you know, if they don't want to answer you, then uh, perhaps you should choose somebody else to listen to. What can I tell you? But uh, it's, it's, it's become a burden where people ask me constant questions uh, for, about other people. You know, they, uh, it's important that uh, each Chacham is careful with the words that he says. As the Mishnah in Avot says, Chachamim tizahu bidivrechem. Say, you know, uh, Chachamim, the uh, scholars, you have to be careful with the words that you say. Not only what you say, but how you say it. And nonetheless, if you find yourself uh, listening to somebody that is saying things that are either against the Torah or saying things that you simply don't understand, switch. Go listen to more of our lectures, listen to Rabbi Ephraim's lectures, listen to uh, 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 some other rabbi's lectures that is uh, still giving you the, uh, the boost, but at the same token is someone that can stand behind their words. Because one of the things that the haters uh, you know, love to, uh, love to say is that, oh, you know, you're constantly mentioning Gehenna, everybody's going to Gehenna, as if I invented this thing. But you'll see, Bezad Hashem, today, a couple of sources of how this is standard among Judaism. It's, it's, it's literally standard among anybody that reads the, the works of the sages will find reward and punishment in practically every sefer. And practically every sefer, the fact that you listen to teddy bears instead of to rabbis and Talmidei Chachamim, and that's why you haven't heard it in 30, 40 years of listening to lectures, that's no fault of the sages. That's perhaps your fault. That's the fault of the people that you choose. As the Gemara also says, Someone that comes to become purified, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives him a hand. You want to look for the truth? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to give you the truthful speakers that say the truth, that quote the truth, and only stay with the truth no matter what the price is, no matter what the burden is, and no matter how much the headache is. 
but someone that's looking to become impure, someone that's looking for justification of their sins, someone that's looking for justification of their distorted mindset, someone that's looking for justification to continue stealing, continue cheating, continue saying Lashon uh, uh, continue doing all the wrong things in accordance to a chef. HaKadosh Baruch will also help them. Why? Because you're looking to find a way to steal, find a way to do all the sinful things, and you're looking for it, because who will help you with that too. Why? Because that's what you're looking for. Now, of course, you're going to get punished for each and every single thing, but nonetheless, don't ever say Hashem never helped you. Don't ever say Hashem, oh, how come you didn't help me do tshuva? I helped you all the time. You want to do something? I helped you. So if you have been listening to Shuret Torah for five, ten years, and you're still on the same level as you were 10 years ago, there's something wrong with you, and there's definitely something wrong with the speakers you're listening to. If you have been listening to Torah for 5, 10, 20 years, your whole life, and you've never heard about Gehenna, there's definitely something wrong with you, and there's definitely something wrong with the teachers that have taught you. Why? Because this is part of our fundamentals. Fundamentals means nothing goes above it, nothing goes above it without it being stable without the fundamentals being stable and when a person doesn't have the fundamentals we see that there it leads to a lot of confusion and unfortunately a lot of distortion of the truth now those people that speak against the reward and punishment those are a special type of sinner that have a very special place in Gehenna and those that make fun of it the Gemara in Masechet Megi- I believe it's uh, Megillah uh, says that uh, at the time of the of the Chachamim, they would simply mashtikinotam. Mashtikinotam, some of the Chachamim uh, comment on it means they killed them, simply. So, of course, we don't kill anybody today with, uh, with, uh, with physicality, but nonetheless, we kill them with the truth. And uh, as you'll see today, there is a difference. There is a difference between people that speak the truth and people that speak lies. And, and today... The Chazonish is going to embellish on that part. So, in uh, the third chapter, section 22, Chazonish now goes into the next point. In essence, the culmination of everything that we've talked about thus far, about uh, someone that dedicates their life to learning Alacha, to learning Musar, to teaching it. Uh, what does what this uh, all uh, uh, come up to? He says the following, now when good characteristics and deeds are combined in one person meaning the uh the person has worked on themselves learned alacha learned musa learns how to uh emulate hashem knows how to practice all of these things in accordance to hashem not in accordance to their distorted mindset when they have good characteristics and deeds and they're combined in one person it's common to change these characteristics from a name of an act to an adjective. Meaning that when you see somebody that has made a persistent effort to not only follow the Torah, not only learn the Torah, but also emulate the traits of Hashem, emulate the traits of his tzaddikim, all of a sudden you will see that the things that he does the things that he does the actions that he does turn into now a new adjective a new description for who he is such as a tzaddik which is a righteous person a chassid which is a pious person a chacham which is a wise person the use of such an adjective implies this person's persistence in good deeds true persistence as well as his having concentrated his energies and sense of purpose on adhering to the good and avoiding the bad. As you notice, the Chachamim are constantly mentioning avoiding the bad. If everyone was getting the same sentence of punishment for bad, why would the Chachamim constantly mention run away from evil and do good? If we're all getting the same punishment, then surely all of us are making some type of sin and during our life, whether it's one sin or a hundred sins or a million sins per day, doesn't really make much of a difference according to the heretics because everybody's getting the same punishment. Then what's the point of keeping anything? Obviously, this doesn't make any logical sense for a truth seeker. Hence the reason why the Chachamim constantly mention 
that you have to be persistent in your good deeds but also persistent in your avoiding the sins avoiding the bad the service of hashem in his life's goal is his life's goal and the ideal he is constantly striving for from the three parts of the torah which is the chumash the prophets the nevi'im and the ktuvim the holy writings as well as from the words of the sages from chazal we see that the adjective tzaddik the adjective chasid the adjective chacham are used for outstanding people beloved by hashem the best of mankind on earth if we search and find someone who has these great attributes that bestow upon him the title of the beloved of Hashem whose creator is happy with him then we will know the way that is beloved to Hashem the way that man ought to conduct himself in simple words the Chazonish is telling us in order for us to know not only what is good in the eyes of Hashem but who is good in the eyes of Hashem we have to look into what was written in the Torah in the five books of Moses in the prophets in the writings and also into the words of the sages that dedicated their entire lives to studying the written and the oral Torah because we will see in those words written by a Kadosh Baruch Hu himself written by his prophets written by his sages we will see who God has defined as somebody extraordinary as this tzaddik as this a beloved person we'll see and from seeing who he defines as this righteous pious person this wise person we will therefore determine not only what is good but who is good and even more so how to repeat the process how do i become good how do i become even more than good but rather beloved by Hashem which means that you become the best of mankind now some of the examples you'll see in the Torah is you'll see that there is a description for Noach Noach ish tzaddik tamim bedorotav Noach was a tzaddik a tamim a complete person is written a verse in the Torah says this about Noah some people foolishly make fun of Noah or diminish the significance of Noah saying oh look the world was destroyed in the days of Noah it's because he wasn't righteous and this and that this is a silly statement nonetheless if the whole world continues the way it does I can assure you that it's not going to stand just for any one of us but nonetheless HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that Noach is tzaddik. Noach is tamim. Now to be righteous, obviously he was following the words of Hashem. But we don't know yet why this righteous, what this righteous means yet. To be tamim means he's complete. Whatever Hashem says, by definition, he listened. That's easier to understand. That's easier to understand. So how do we know what tzaddik means? How do we know what tzaddik means? We go to Divrei Chazal. We go to Divrei Chazal. We go to the words of the sages. As a tzaddik, who is a tzaddik? Someone who's a shomer brit. Someone who protects their brit does not commit immoral crimes, which means wasting seed, adultery, uh, being with their wives when it's not permitted, being uh, incestual, homosexual, all of these filthy, disgusting, immoral acts in accordance to Hashem immorality defined by Hashem not by society all of those things that are considered immoral in the eyes of Hashem that person runs away from them and he does not fall for any of the tests that the Satan sends him Noah was a tzaddik Noah protected his breed one of the ways that we know that Noah did is because the Zohar Kadosh says that the reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu simply decided to destroy the world is because he decided that it was a lost cause 
it was a lost cause why was it a lost cause they were cheating they were lying they were stealing they were doing a lot of things the last thing that broke the camel's back is when they started stealing from each other to the point of uh, bankrupting each other but that was the last thing that broke the straw's back what was the main thing the Zohar Kadosh says that they were committing immoral crimes they were wasting seed and they became so immoral that homosexuality became like a mitzvah in their eyes they started making a chupa and kiddushim for two homosexual men or two homosexual women so much so that their filthy disgusting acts affected the world around them not just the other people but also the other creatures the animals became homosexual the ground had impurity on it so much so that hashem when he destroyed the world he didn't just destroy the people he destroyed the animals and he even destroyed part of the ground to remove as much of the filth that came from those actions and noah was the only one that protected his belief, him and his family so this gave him the merit that the whole world can stand on him where else do we see that this is indeed the correct and only definition of a tzaddik yosef at tzaddik yosef at tzaddik is called yosef at tzaddik because yosef withstood the test when eshet potiphar the wife of potiphar tried to induce him and entice him to uh, fall with her and she was a very beautiful woman the gemara says she was one of the four most beautiful women that ever lived when the gemara says that a woman was beautiful it's not trying to give you thoughts but rather trying to give you an understanding of the magnitude of the test there are other places that the gemara mentions beautiful women it says that sarai menu sarai menu was the most beautiful woman that ever lived aside from chava aside from chava how beautiful was sarah the gemara says if you take the most beautiful woman in the world during your day the most beautiful one won all the contests in the world she looks like a monkey with hair on his face next to sarah Imenu. that's how beautiful sarah was her skin was shining like the sun her skin was shining that's how beautiful she was and sarah was like a monkey next to chava next to eve the wife of adam arishon that's how beautiful eve was but nonetheless sarah was something out of this world and our but yet the most modest woman that you can imagine so much so that our own husband avraham did not realize how beautiful she was until late many many years later that they were married because she was so modest but the point being is, is that Sarah's modesty was a blessing a blessing rather than some of the people out there that have beauty and their beauty turns into a curse so Sarah's beauty was a blessing because that's why she got such a prophecy that's even higher than Avraham Avinu because she used that beauty in the right places women today unfortunately if they have gift of beauty they use it the wrong way and that beauty turns into a curse and they end up getting punished for that beauty but nonetheless the woman that was trying to entice Yosef at Sadiq to fall and commit an act with her which technically according to according to the letter of the law he was allowed to do it he could just simply kill Potiphar kill Potiphar and marry her she because he knew that his life would be in danger technically you can find a way to actually justify it but yet Yosef protected his breed knew that if he commits this immoral act he will have to pay for it forever not just in this world but forever from the Gemara says that Yosef knew Yosef knew that if he commits the act with her she will be with him in the next world and from there Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai teaches us from there we learn that a Jew that commits an immoral act with a non-Jew she's glued to him like a dog glued to him like a dog first she becomes glued then the Shamot get glued she doesn't leave him she goes with him in Olam Abba. wherever Genom he's with he's, she's over there with him but even more so in order to rectify in order to rectify this immoral act of a Jew being with a non-Jew 
he has to eat if he doesn't do tshuva during this life he has to be reincarnated as a dog so here Chachamim tell us that it's not for naught that Yosef was called a tzaddik because it's not that he just passed on some girl it was the most beautiful girl and it was a girl that was rich and successful and powerful and his life was on the line but yet he passed the test hence the reason why he's called Yosef a tzaddik and he's like the uh prime example of somebody that was protecting his breed also the uh from there we also learn that Yosef at Sadiq as he himself was a very beautiful man so much so that again anyone in today's world would look like a monkey next to him but needless to say Yosef was reserved was modest was not spending hours in front of the mirror like uh, young men today which by itself just as a side note is a su according to the Shulchan Aruch it's not allowed for a man to stand in front of the mirror for an extended period of time it's completely forbidden it's considered a uh, sin but anyway the point is is that the, uh, the 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 people today don't know a lot of these things and they figure that oh if I protected my bleed for a month that means that I'm already a tzaddik no habibi that doesn't mean you're a tzaddik it just means you're following the law just means you're following the law it doesn't mean it's, it's it's bad it's good but don't start uh calling yourself a tzaddik in public and don't ask anybody to call you a tzaddik or start standing up when you start walking in why because it takes a little longer a little more than just uh, passing a test for a month to be a tzaddik another place we see in the torah of another person that gets a description avram avinu avram or avai Avram, my lover, my beloved. Hashem calls Avram Avinu my beloved. Why is Avram or Avai? Why is he uh, my beloved? Shomre mitzvotai. He observes my commandments. From there we learn that those that keep the commandments of Akadosh Baruch Hu are the ones that he loves the most. Are the ones that he loves the most. And we hear and we see in Parashat Vayet Hanan, that those that do not keep the commandments, Akadosh Baruch Hu calls them Sonai, those that hate me. If you don't observe Shabbat, Akadosh Baruch Hu says, Oh, my son, my daughter drives on Shabbat, they hate me. They hate me. If you do not keep Kashrut, Akadosh Baruch Hu says, Oh, you see my son, my daughter, I gave the money to go buy a car. What do they do? They drive that car on Shabbat. I gave the money to go buy food, they buy non kosher food. I gave the money to go give tzedakah. What do they do? They go gamble it in a casino. I give them all of the blessings. And what do they do? They use those blessings against me. They hate me. So Akadosh Baruch says, those that do not keep his mitzvot are considered his haters. They hate him. They hate Hashem. It's a terrible, terrible uh, description, but nonetheless, the truth. So here we see a few descriptions a few descriptions of people that Akadosh Baruch Hu has in the Torah as people that love him as people that are righteous what about on the other side we see that Moshe Rabbeinu sees that there are two Jews fighting and one of them has his hand in the air about to hit the other he says Rasha he calls the person Rasha from there Chachamim teach us that you don't have to already commit violence to another Jew in order to be decreed a rasha. Already the fact that you are threatening him already by itself makes you a rasha. Already threatening to hit another Jew, you already decreed a rasha. That's another description. The another one is when he tells everybody to stay away from these rashaim. Who are these rashaim? Korach ve'adato. Korach. Why is Korach a uh, rasha? because he was not listening to Hashem but he didn't say I'm not listening to Hashem he says I'm not listening to Moshe Rabbeinu he's not my rabbi he's just Moshe to me by not listening to the rabbi you're not listening to Hashem therefore called Rasha so here we see there's a few different description and of course there is an endless amount of other descriptions in the Torah for the different prophets and the different tzaddikim that are in there but the point being is is that the Chazonish tells us that by learning the descriptions that Hashem uses for Moshe, Moshe Avdi, Moshe my servant, Isha Elohim, the man of God, Avram or Avai, 
uh, Noach, Ish Tzadik Tamim, Yosef Tzadik, all of these descriptions, they're not for naught. There's a reason why this is mentioned in the Torah specifically about those people, because it has to do with different tests or different lessons that we have to learn from that particular word. And Chazoni says, from there, one of the main things that we learn is who is truly beloved in the eyes of Hashem in order for us to emulate that person, to do the same thing as that person if we also want to be a tzaddik, a chacham, a uh, chassid. What about if I want to be a chassid uh, breslev? I want to be chassid chabad. I want to be chassid of something else. Sure, you could be chassid for anything else, but that doesn't mean that Hashem calls you a chassid. You could be Hasid uh, Dizengoff. You could be Hasid Florida. You could be Hasid New York. Call yourself Hasid uh, Pikachu. That'll make a difference. To be a, be a real Hasid in the eyes of Hashem, you have to be a pious person in accordance to Hashem. In accordance to Hashem. And from there we need to learn who is called a Hasid in the Torah, in the writings, in the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the sages. Where, who is called a Hasid? Now, if a person wants to truly find out and truly emulate that person, it's very easy. The access is very easy. And the Chazonish gives us some examples. In the Gemara, Masechet Bavakama, page 41b. Let's get Masechet Bavakama, page 41b. It says that Shimon... Am Suni or Nehemia Am Suni would extrapolate Alachot from every et in the Torah. When he reached the verse et Hashem Elokecha Tira, which means you shall fear Hashem your God, which is in the uh, book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 13, he took back his words until Rabbi Akiva came and taught that et Hashem, uh, et over there comes to add Torah scholars who should be revered. What is this really talking about? Let's see. That's why we have to bring the Gemara. So the Gemara, Masechet Bava Kama, talks about different halachot, different uh, uh, things that we need to know, how the sages think, how the sages determine different things. But it t- tells us, a, it's trying to teach us a lesson uh, of uh, how there is no extra word in the Torah. Everything is there for a reason. Even the word et. Et, in English, could be translated to the word the. The. Now, if you said, I am uh, the best, I am the worst, great. Great. No one's really going to think there's any extra value in the word the in your sentence other than being grammatically correct. In the Torah, on the other hand, anytime the word et appears, it's not always needed. Meaning, you can do without it. You can do without it. So the Chachamim say, from there we learn that this et is here specifically to teach us something. So the Gemara says, that one of the uh, Chachamim, uh, by the name of Shimona Am- Amsoni, or some others say that it was a relative of his, Nehemia Amsoni, would expound every time that he found in a Torah the word it. And he taught that each time the word it came to include that it had a specific lesson. And he knew each one. This is the reason why the word et means. This one is the reason why the word et is here. This is the reason why the word et is over there and so on and so forth. It always, it's supposed to add an, an additional lesson. But then he got to the verse in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 13, which says, et Hashem tira, that it means that uh, uh, you're a uh, God, uh, Hashem, your God, you should uh, fear. So he says, what is more than this? What is more than this? When it says, for example, I'll give you guys an example so you understand the meaning. When it says, 
כבד את אביך ואימך, that you should, uh, you should uh, honor your father and your mother, but it has the word et in it. So from there, they extrapolate and say, oh, because the et is referring to your older brother. You have to honor your mother and your father and also your older brother. You have to they also owe him honor. So the et is supposed to add to the existing meaning. But here he gets to a verse that says that you have to honor, you have to uh, uh, fear Hashem. But it says, et Hashem. Who else? Who else can you fear as much as Hashem? And he was scared to give any type of comparison. So much so that he withdrew his commentary and he retracted all of his earlier expositions saying to everybody disregard the entire shield we just went through five hours of explaining every time the torah says the word it each time we give you a meaning 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 and all made sense but there's an it we don't have an explanation for and if we don't have an explanation for it therefore that means that everything that we said perhaps it's wrong perhaps it's just simply our own idea so one of his students says but Rebbe uh, what about all of the uh, work that we you've done this far all the effort you put into every single verse to expound it to get the real meaning of everything uh, what's gonna happen with that he says just like I got the reward from Hashem for teaching you I'll get the reward for not teaching you for in essence showing that Perhaps I could be wrong and, uh, you know, I could uh, uh, admit my wrong uh, understanding. And that's it. I'll get a reward for that also. Shows what kind of humility the rabbis, the scholars had during those days. Of course, there are scholars today that have extraordinary humility, but unfortunately, you don't find that much of that on YouTube. Now, Rabbi Akiva comes. Rabbi Akiva comes, the Gemara says, and says, no, the only mistake, the only mistake that the Talmud Chacham, the Talmud Chacham made was that he thought that just because he doesn't have a meaning for that particular verse, the rest of his expounding is incorrect. But that's incorrect. Why? Because there is a meaning for it. What's the meaning? What's the meaning? Rabbi Akiva says, Rabbi Akiva says, Et Hashem Elokecha Tira, that you shall revere, Et Hashem your God is trying to teach you that you must include in the, your fear of Hashem to revere the Torah scholars, the Talmidei Chachamim. That's what a Kadosh Baruch Hu is trying to teach you. You have to revere me, but you have to revere my Talmidei Chachamim. And from there, the Chachamim learn in the Mishnah in Avot, where there is a uh, specific teachings that uh, says, Mora Rabcha, Mora Shamayim. The uh, Mishnah in Avot, chapter 4, uh, Mishnah number 12, that you have to have as much fear of your rabbi like you have fear of heaven. Where is the uh, source? This is one of the sources, Gemara, and obviously the Mishnah preceded it. That was his source. You have this particular verse, it has the word et Hashem, because you have to fear the rabbi, your rabbi specifically, uh, or the Gdole Ado, or both, as much as you fear God. That's the lesson here. Now, the question is, why did Rabbi Akiva have to be the one to teach this? Why wasn't it the Chacham that originally expounded the rest of the Torah? Expounded the rest of the Torah, he has a commentary on every single et in the Torah, which is many of them. But he falls for one, he doesn't have a meaning for one, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes it that Rabbi Akiva will be the one that does it. So the Chassonish says, we learn 
from this that the most desired and excellent personality according to the Torah is the personality that deserves the title of a Torah scholar and Rabbi Akiva allowed himself to compare the reverence that should be felt towards this highly valued person to the reverence that is due to Hashem extrapolating it from the verse et Hashem elokecha tira that you uh, you shall fear uh, Hashem your God to give us the uh, the uh, teaching that we have to fear the scholars and if this is so if this is so then if we know the precious acquisitions that enable that person to deserve this title we will know the important deeds that are beloved to Hashem the desired actions and behaviors of a person on earth during his lifetime so here we see that Rabbi Akiva and his teachings was accepted among all of Chachmei Israel that you have to fear your rabbi and he has sources that preceded him nonetheless and this is one of the sources in the Torah now in the Shulchan Aruch this is actually not just a saying but there's actually an entire section in the Shulchan Aruch in the uh, Yoreh De'a in Siman 243 there's an entire Siman designated to the teachings of how to treat your rabbi and specifically specifically talking about how a person needs to fear their rabbi how a person needs to treat their rabbi respect their rabbi and so on and so forth so much so that if a person truly understood what they had what kind of uh, what kind of responsibility they had in their hands they wouldn't treat their rabbis the way they do why because they'd see that people that mistreat scholars mistreat chachamim Akadosh Baruch Hu takes it much more personally than uh, he takes it when people mistreat him. Now, the uh, problem today is that there's really almost no one that is accepted by people as a rabbi today. Not because of qualifications, but rather because most people do not know what it means to have a rabbi. They don't know what it means to honor a rabbi. In the previous generations, things were very, very different. People would honor their rabbis. They would do whatever their rabbi said, even if it didn't make sense to them. Today, even simply the way people say hello to their rabbis is, at best case scenario, like a friend, like a buddy. You know, they gave him a nice chapcha to the back. Hey, rabbi, how are you? What's going on? How's everything? Now, this may sound, you know, may look like, oh, you're friendly. You know, you give a big strong hug to the rabbi it sounds like you really care about each other and so on in reality this could be considered as if you are uh dishonoring the rabbi why perhaps you're making him uncomfortable perhaps you're treating him like everybody else so that's why one of the things that uh rabbi Freim has taught me is like listen even if you have somebody that calls you their rabbi don't in your own mind you can let them do whatever they want but in your own mind don't really like accept it as really you're their rabbi why because surely at some point they'll fail and not treat you like a rabbi and you don't want Hashem to punish them because if you really are their rabbi and they treat you like you're their buddy hey rabbi listen I need you to answer the call now I'm I'm really in a serious trouble I need you to pick up the phone I know you're busy but I need you to call me now like that the person can get a punishment for that that's what it means fear your rabbi like fear God like you aren't gonna tell God hey God I need you to give me uh, whatever I want now unless you're sociopath or you're delusional you have some type of mental illness you're not gonna do that you're not gonna do that what Rabbi Akiva is trying to teach us is that you need to understand that your rabbi has to be treated in a similar fashion has to be treated in a similar fashion and, and quite frankly very few very few people really understand the ramifications of truly having a rabbi unfortunately they are calling people rabbis based on uh, the wrong terms uh, most people think that a talmit chacham is someone that's popular on youtube oh look this guy is a big tzaddik he's a big talmit chacham why he has uh 50 000 subscribers on youtube so surely he's a scholar okay that's how you determine scholars wow 
That's, uh, I guess the description is, uh, the, the definition of scholar has changed over the years. Yeah, listen, if you're not, if you're not popular, then that means you're not a scholar. Oh, so Rav Ovadia doesn't have a YouTube channel. Rav Ezra Atia doesn't have a YouTube channel. Rav uh, Kanievsky doesn't have a YouTube channel. Uh, his father, the Stipe Lagoon, doesn't have a YouTube channel. So what, they're all not scholars? They're all nothing? All of the, the, the Rabbi Yosef Karo was never on YouTube even. Was never on you. You're never even gonna find a video of Rabbi Yosef Karo on YouTube. Rambam for sure anti YouTube. He's against YouTube. So what? You uh, you are not scholars. People are unfortunately misguided. They think that if you have subscribers, you have likes, you have views, therefore you are a scholar. There's nothing further from the truth. Nothing further from the truth. Sometimes they think that the guy is the most friendly, the one that's telling them the, you know, the nicest stories that makes them feel good all the time. That must be the scholar. That must be the, the one that's the rabbi of the generation. Like every other day, there's a new guy that says he's the rabbi of America. He's the rabbi of some other country. And always, always, everybody that calls themselves a rabbi of America or rabbi of any country, nine out of ten times, pretty much every time I've ever seen it, that person is 100% a heretic. It's not even, not only they're not the rabbi of, of, of America, but they're like the Erev Rav of America. They're, you know, usually they're, they're, they're just completely upside down in mentality, upside down in logic, upside down in halacha. Many times they're either reform or they call themselves uh, 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 orthodox but are reform. And uh, unfortunately, many people fall for the trap and say, look, but how, why do you determine, why, how did you decide to listen to this guy? Well, he's the rabbi of America. Well, he's not my rabbi. He's not the rabbi of a lot of people that I know. So what's the other determining factor? Well, he has a million people like him on Facebook. Oh, that's, that's how you pick your rabbis? By their celebrity status? That's what we've gone to? And unfortunately, yes, that's what we've gone to. Today, we have a generation of people that pick their rabbis based on their celebrity status based on their clothing sometimes based on all of the wrong things it reminds me of a joke that really has a lot of musar in it where this one guy went to a pet store and uh he was looking for a parrot and he sees one parrot he sees parrot beautiful parrot 500 dollars. but next to him he sees another parrot looks very similar but this one ten thousand dollars that's the store owner excuse me why is there such a difference? So, oh, no, no, that parrot is, there, is special. What's so special about him? That parrot, for $10,000, he knows the entire five books of Moses by heart. Psh, you know what? It's worth it for $10,000. You know the whole much every verse? He goes, try it, go ahead. The guy is amazed. $10,000, I have a living chumash. I can make a fortune off of this. So, you know what? I think I'm going to take it. Eyes is about to grab it, he sees there's another parrot next to him, and in the corner of an eyes, he sees fifty thousand dollars. Whoa, fifty thousand. What does he know? He goes, oh, this one, he knows the entire Talmud Bavli by heart. Fifty thousand, it's a good deal. I'm telling you. He says, yeah, I mean, this guy knows the Chumash by heart. If he knows the Bavli, he probably knows the Chumash too. 50,000, maybe, maybe it's worth it. I'll make a fortune off of this guy. He says, you know what? I think this one is what I'm going to go with. Okay, as he's walking to the cash register, he sees right behind the cash register, there's a huge gold cage. But in the gold cage, it's a tiny little ugly parrot in there. Not as beautiful as the other two. Not even the same size. But price tag, one million dollars. And he says to him, Ribono Shilolam. I don't understand. The first one, 500 bucks, regular parrot. Second one, $10,000, he knows the whole chumash. Third one, he knows the entire Talmud, probably 50,000. What is this one for a million dollars? The stone owner says, listen, I don't know what he knows, but all I know is that every time those two Look at him and say, Kvod Arav, Kvod Arav, Kvod Arav, Kvod Arav. Your, your, my, my rabbi, the, your honor. They call him rabbi. So if they call him rabbi, surely he knows more. This unfortunately today is funny. It's not funny. Why? Because many people will call people that are not only not rabbis, they're not even scholars. 
They'll call them rabbis. They won't know anything about the basics of Judaism, but they're called rabbis today. Of course, there are many good people that don't call themselves rabbis and should. Like one of my dear friends, I had to convince him that he has to call himself rabbi because he's not only a scholar, but he's also a teacher. And according to Allah, he has to call himself a rabbi. He has to call himself a rabbi. This is one of the things that is necessary sometimes in the world today if you're going to be respected by your students. If you just call yourself Steve, yeah, surely your students may respect you, but more likely than not, they're going to treat you like a friend. Why? Because every seri- every profession to, uh, that, that's going to be taken seriously has to have some type of title. That's just the way the world is. Even more so in the rabbinical world. But unfortunately, many times you'll see that the people that don't deserve the title or any title whatsoever other than a negative title, other than a bad title, like uh, Rasha or Aru or Erev Rav or something like that, of that uh, type of uh, description, they, on the other hand, get the opposite. They get called Tzaddik, they get called Chacham, they get called Rabbi, and all types of other, uh, other descriptions. And one of the reasons is because most people simply do not understand, do not understand what makes a scholar a scholar. They simply don't understand what makes a scholar a scholar. Sometimes you'll have this even in the world that's not necessarily in the media or in a, in a uh, YouTube, perhaps you'll have it, in uh, different uh, yeshivot or kolels, well, you'll see some guy that is cannot even be called a scholar, doesn't know how to behave, but was given a job to be the rosh kolel. How? What's the rosh kolel? He was given a job to simply write the paychecks every uh, month. He gives the paychecks to the avrechim, and that's all he's good for. He doesn't know how to learn. He doesn't know how to teach. All he knows how to do is write the paychecks and insult the avrechim. Take advantage of them treat them like slaves of course a person like this is not only not a rabbi not a uh, uh, not someone that's a uh, should be a rabbi but even more so this person is a rasha and of course a kadosh baruch Hu will take the vengeance on such a person at some point just like the chafetz chaim said that if we learn from the torah we see in a uh, parashat yitro a kadosh baruch Hu tells moshe rabbeinu tell am israel not to touch the mountain for whoever touches the mountain mot yumat will have death upon death rashi on the on the verse says what is death upon death for touching the mountain they will lose this world and the next world when you see mot yumat it means both death in this world and the next world so for anyone that touches the mountain says the chafetz chaim will lose this world and the next world and not just a physical mountain needless to say if anyone touches a torah scholar a beloved of hashem someone that's toiling in torah even if no one in the world knows of him even if he's never written a book but every day he toils to learn torah every day he tries his best to learn torah and you insult him and you touch him and you do all types of things to cause damage to him both spiritually physically and otherwise you my friend lose your olam haba such people lose their olam haba but sometimes those people are the rosh kolel sometimes they're the rosh yeshiva you'll see some of these people that call themselves rosh yeshiva <coughs> also do all types of awful things to the children of uh, of of uh, insulting them or shemishmo molesting them in some cases of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that's monitoring everything. He will pay each person what he deserves, whether that's reward or punishment. And surely those people that harm children of Hashem, that harm the scholars of Hashem, that harm the beloved of Hashem, even if that harm is not physically, even if that harm is simply insulting them, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will pay at a certain time. There was one, uh, 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 one person that uh, unfortunately decided to practice this ugly minhag. This ugly minhag in the Frum world started in the certain parts of Europe years ago. And apparently it's, uh, it was done in, this, in the beginning with some tact, but with the degradation of the generations, it's, uh, it's all over. It's, all, it's done in, in different places all over the world, both in Ashkenazi communities and Sephardi, where they have this minag that's uh, called Purim Rav. What is Purim Rav? Where during Purim, 
somebody in the yeshiva decides to make fun of the rabbi make fun of the rabbi practical jokes uh, all types of silly things this is really not a uh, not a good minag to say the least and an example of it i learned just today from what Ephraim, that there was a young talmid in Eretz Israel learning in Porat Yosef Porat Yosef is known for some of the greatest scholars that ever lived whether it's a uh, Rav Ovadia or Rav Kaduri or uh, the uh, some of the uh, the Rav Zev uh, both of them oh, a lot of big scholars came from Rav Tzion Abba Shaul Rav Ezra Atiyah, many many great Chachamim came from Porat Yosef now unfortunately they uh, some people were not exactly scholars and some people wanted to have a good time practicing this minag so one time during uh, Purim this uh, one young Talmud decided that uh, instead of putting uh, sugar in the rabbi's uh, coffee he's gonna put salt he's gonna put salt thought it was cute and that's what he did and the rabbi as soon as he drank the coffee he smiled you know noticing the uh the humor here but one of the guys the guy that did it apparently started laughing at his face like, ah, ah. the rabbi didn't think of that part as funny he says to them oh you're mocking a talmid chacham surely you're gonna die this year and that's exactly what happened that young kid died that year not because the rabbi wanted him to die but because akadosh baruch Hu does not find favor in people that make fun of scholars and many times tragedy comes to them tragedy comes to them and some people akadosh baruch Hu has less patience than others if anybody remembers in the books and the uh, the media there was uh, a young uh, stupid woman that left the world of orthodoxy and instead of just going into some hole and living her life of secularism she tried to do whatever she could to make fun of the torah make fun of the rabbis make fun of god with the worst possible thing what with immorality and she would have somebody take pictures of her practically nude but she would wrap herself with different Jewish attire whether it's a talit or otherwise and one of the uh pictures I'm told I never saw this Baruch Hashem she it would became a caused a big uh uh Hilu Hashem a big desecration of Hashem's name she wrapped herself with tefillin where the only thing she was wearing was the tefillin straps around her whole body and of course in the rabbinical world people was an uproar in the secular anti-Torah world it was an uproar they enjoyed it they had fun with it they thought it's cute but you know what no one really thought it was cute that a few months later she got into some type of accident and she became completely disabled for life nobody found that cute nobody found that humorous but that by the way that suffering that she has for the rest of what's left in her life of being disabled and no longer beautiful and no longer attractive and no longer funny that rabotai is the least the least of the punishment she's going to get for what she did those women that are behind the so-called orthodox shows on netflix the damage that's going to come to them in this world is certain there's no doubt in my mind that they're going to suffer severely in this world but whatever they suffer in this world unless they do complete complete chuba it's literally not even a down payment for what they're going to get in the next world the same goes for all of those people that say things that are against the sham say things that are the opposite of what the torah says each and every single one of them will get punished severely severely just like our chachamim teach us now of course people don't necessarily like to think about punishment and in fact they like to make fun of punishment but this was already discussed by our sages to deal with such people 
in the great Sefer called Share Tshuva. One of the fundamentals of Musar and just simple Ashkafic understanding of what Judaism is and not what people think it is. In the third gate, section 187, Rabbi Yonah says, talks about the flatterers, the people that are smooth talkers, that distort the Torah to their likings, telling people that there is no Gehenna that is permanent, that is forever, that is a, uh, a punishment that's painful, that everyone is beloved by Hashem, that everyone is going to go to heaven, all of those liars. Rabbeinu Yonah says, the first category of flatterers who recognizes or sees or knows that his fellow man's hand is tainted with sin and that he embraces deceit or that he sins through Lashon or verbal abuse, but smooth talks him with an evil tongue and says you have committed no wrong. Not only has the flatterer committed a transgression of withholding the rebuke, as the verse in the book of uh, uh, Leviticus says, chapter 19, verse 17, you must rebuke uh, your fellow man, but he further sins by saying, you have not sinned. And on him it is written, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 14, they have strengthened the hand of the evildoers. And this is a serious transgression in the hand of the foolish flatterer, for he is not zealous for the truth, but abets falsehood, declaring evil to be good and making light into darkness. It's the types of people that say, oh, listen, you don't have to believe in Gehenna, it's only in Midrashim, it's only fairy tale." Ben Yonah says, such people have a very, very serious problem with Hashem. Have a very serious problem with Hashem. And further, he says, he also places a pitfall before the sinner from two vantage points. Firstly, as in, in, in this case, the sinner does not regret the evil that he did. So the, the sinner that you just told him, listen, everybody's going to go to heaven. Everyone's okay. Hashem loves everyone. He's not going to regret the evil. And that's one of the, that is the, the, one of the fundamental steps of tshuva. If a person does not regret the evil that he did, he doesn't regret being with the non-Jew. He doesn't regret stealing. He doesn't regret eating non-kosher. He doesn't regret anything. He hasn't done tshuva. If he doesn't done tshuva, he has to go to Gehenom. And in some cases, forever. So because of you, he doesn't regret his evil. And secondly, he repeats his foolishness the next day. Why? Because he doesn't think it's a sin. You told him everything's okay. He continues to desecrate Shabbat and so on and so forth. And eventually, this person will get a much worse punishment than he would have gotten had he listened to someone that's a truthful speaker. Now, of course, some people are going to say, wait, listen, but maybe, maybe it is true. Maybe that uh, there's different opinions about Gehenom maybe uh that's not what the sages say maybe that's just a midrash or so on well first of all i have a whole shiur about Gehenom. as i said Gehenom is mentioned in the torah in all places you have it in the five books of moses uh, the uh the uh word sheol is one of the uh, uh word descriptions of Gehenom. it's one of the names of Gehenom. people sometimes think that if you don't see this specific word in the torah that means it doesn't exist just like you have different names so do different things in the torah you have uh, let's say your wife uh doesn't call you by your first name she may call you uh my love she may call you uh you know my my sickness she may call you a lot of things she doesn't always call you by your first name so akadosh who also has different things that have different names genom has eight names has eight names has seven specific names plus the name genom has eight names one of them is sheol you look at parashat korach it says that korach with his followers went into sheol sheol sheola it's called both so the ground opened up and he's still there to this day what do you think he's in taj mahal you think he's in cancun you think he's uh how he's on a beach somewhere no he's suffering till this day over 3300 years he's still there in a place that there's no time 
So the point being is, over there we not only see that Genom lasts for more than a year, but even more so, Genom has multiple places, and it's mentioned in the Torah. In the last verse of the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, the last verse, you'll see that uh, Isaiah talks about Gehenom. You look at the uh, Rashi over there, specifically mentions what, what uh, Isaiah is mentioning here, the sinners that will go to Gehenom forever. Sinners that will go to Gehenom forever. And you can say, yeah, but maybe this is a Midrash, maybe this is, uh, they didn't mean it that way, maybe some of the Chachamim disagreed. So then you go to the Oral Torah. You look at Pirkei Avot, in Pirkei Avot, there's a whole, uh, uh, a few Mishnayot that talk about as panim legenom, those that are arrogant, like some of these speakers that we speak against, uh, go to genom. The arrogant go to genom. They like to make fun of genom. They like to make fun of uh, reward and punishment. They like to make fun of the sages. They're for sure going to genom. Now the Gemara in Masechet uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, page 17a and also 16b, Masechet uh, Baba Metzia, and, and uh, Masechet Shabbat, and many other places. There are literally over 5,000 places that we know of that there are teachings about Genom. Literally, over 5,000 sources. We're not talking about like 5,000 books or 5,000 places. 5,000 sources, meaning that each one has it in a, uh, a numerous times. Numerous times that there's Genom, and there's eternal Genom, and there's temporary Genom, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of teachings in between. But the point being is that you go to written Torah, you go to the prophets, you go to, uh, surely David the Melech mentioned it uh, in many times, then you go to the Mishnah, which is in, in Masechet Avot, then you go into the Gemara, uh, which is, like I said, uh, the few ma- Gemarot that I just mentioned, and then you go to what's Alakha, what do the Chachamim say, what is Divrei Chazad, the Rishonim, the Achonim, what do they say? Let's see, let's see what the the Shonim said, we're going to go, we're going to go to the Ramban, Nechmanides. Now, no one's going to say, oh, Nechmanides, nah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Nechmanides, nah, we don't listen to him. No one in their right mind will simply say that, unless they're an Apikos, unless they're a person that just simply uh, doesn't want to believe anything that uh, is uh, disagreeing with their own uh, uh, warped logic. But, the Nachmanides goes into detail about Genom. He gives even details of what happens in there. And in a Shah Agmul, which is actually called the Gate of Reward, he has both reward and punishment. This is exactly his words in English. There is still a more severe form of this punishment among those liable to karet, which is excision in English. The body is cut off from life in this world and the soul is cut off even from life in the world to come and lead us to say from life in Gan Eden he is punished in Gehenom forever. So Nechmanides the Ramban says Gehenom can be forever just like it says in multiple places. Now what about those people that don't believe that Gehenom is forever. Let's see. These sinners who are so punished are worshippers of idols and heretics, such as those enumerated by the sages in the Mishnah, and these are the ones who have no share in the world to come. He who says that the resurrection of the dead is not a doctrine of the Torah, that the Torah is not transmitted from heaven, is a scuffer. Also included in this category is what the rabbis have added there too in the Bereta mentioned in Tosefta, which is he's referring to Tosefta in Sanhedrin. They have uh, they have joined the following: the one who cast off the yoke by denying the essential principles of our religion, and the one who breaks the covenant of the circumcision, meaning it's the one that uh, wastes seed of the flesh and perverts the sense of the Torah. Then a few lines later he says, these will descend to Gehenom and will be punished there for all generations. Meaning, Gehenom is a place that some people go to forever. Not just for a temporary amount of time. Again, in Shagmul again he says later on, 
says that all the wicked person whose sins exceed their merits are judged according to their sins and have a portion in the world to come for all israel have a share of the world to come these are the ones who have no share of the world to come but are instead cut off perish and are eternally punished in accordance with their great wickedness and sinfulness the sadducees the scuffers people like to make fun of the torah make like make fun of reward and punishment the deniers of the torah etc these people go to genom eternally rabban rishon now all those who don who, who drawn after physical pleasures and cast the truth behind themselves thus allowing falsehood to prevail over their truth will be cut off and extirpated from that attainment all that will remain of them will be a perishable body now interestingly enough the Ramban dealt literally with every type of heretic that exists including the ones that exist today the ones that exist today are like puppies next to the ones that the Ramban dealt with now the Ramban dealt with so people that like to minimize the punishment and so on And he brings different sources that talk about everlasting genom, everlasting genom, eternal genom, and so on. And he says that those who say that genom is not a place where there's permanent permanent punishment are considered heretics themselves so he says here for those who are liable to karet this judgment of terrible pain for the soul is further increased twofold on the day of the great judgment they're punished in Genom until they are destroyed there. From here, a rational person will understand that there's no division of opinion among our rabbis on the main principles of the future great judgment. All their words passed under one banner, meaning all the people that will try to distort what the sages say. Oh, see here, it says that Genom is only one year. It's over here, it says this, it says that. It says, no, you're just simply not understanding. You're simply not understanding what the uh what the sages are saying and you're translating it the way you want now Now, what's the reason why the uh, Ramban says that those people that say that Genom is not uh, forever are uh, heretics? The reason why is because he says that those that um, that say that Genom is only limited to one year turn God into an evil evil God. Why? Because a God that gives everybody the same punishment whether you murdered one person or you murdered 50 people whether you violated one shabbat or you violated many shabbatot that's an evil god that's an unjust god so for that in itself those people that minimize the punishment become heretics according to our torah now of course those people that make fun of the rabbis the gemara already says they're considered apikosim they're considered just simply those that make fun of the sages are considered heretics now you're gonna say wait a minute but maybe this is the Ramban maybe some other great Rishonim disagreed with him maybe other uh, maybe the Ramban didn't say it like some people say yeah the Ramban didn't talk about Genom Ramban didn't talk about Genom what does it show it shows that they never read the Rambam they're simply ignorant people they're ignorant people why you look at the Rambam 
You look at the Ramban, Ilchot Tshuva. What does Ilchot Tshuva mean? The Alachot, the laws of Tshuva. The laws of serving a Kadosh Baruch Hu and returning to Him, which means that you have to understand what is at stake. In Ilchot Tshuva, the Ramban writes, chapter 8, Alachah number 5, the retribution beyond which there is no greater retribution is that the soul will be cut off and no merit and not merit this life as the torah says in the book of numbers chapter 15 verse 31 this soul shall surely be cut off his sin shall remain upon him this refers to the obliteration of the soul which was referred to by the prophets with the following metaphoric terms in uh, Tehilim, Psalm 55, verse 24, the pit of destruction, or in Tehilim 88, verse 12, the bonfire, or obliteration, or in Isaiah, the bonfire, or in, uh, in Proverbs, the leech, all the synonyms for nullification and destruction are used to refer to it, for it is the ultimate nullification after which there is no renewal and the ultimate loss which can never be recovered so here we see that a person can be eternally punished not just a temporary situation of course the ramban mentions it in other places as well this is not just one place this is not just the one a uh, happenstance if you will But of course, those that want to believe will believe. Those that look for excuses will also find them too. The question is, why was Rabbi Akiva the one that had to bring this teaching? Why couldn't it be Shimon Amsuni or Nehemiah Amsuni? Why was it Rabbi Akiva? So the Gemara in Masechet Psachim, page 49b, says a story. What's the story? Rabbi Akiva, a giant rabbi, 24,000 students, each one greater than the next, comes to the Bet Midrash, the Gemara says, it says, I want to tell you a story. Now you have a uh, crowd you get a lecture you get 500 people you're already excited to tell whatever they're willing to listen to thousand people even more excited you want to say your best you want to say your best story you want to say the best teachings you want to say the greatest thing ever the Chachamim teach us that when Moshe Rabbeinu was shown Rabbi Akiva which lived many many years centuries after him he was shown Rabbi Akiva was teaching his Talmidim intricate laws to be learned from the crowns of the letters meaning how the letter is written the hebrew letter is written in the sefer Torah. there are even lessons to be learned from the crowns of the letters to show us that you could literally learn something from everything in a torah and there's nothing there that's extra just like he taught us that the word it is to teach us something significant and not something minute not something insignificant not something that you could just live without he also taught laws from the crowns of the letters so now if he got all of his talmidim together and he wants to teach them something you're gonna think oh he's probably gonna teach them the most important lesson there is right well apparently it is what's the lesson he tells us talmidim Take a seat. I want to teach you a shiul. 24,000 students are excited. 24,000 students are really excited to see the father of the oral Torah. The Kodesh Kodeshim, Rabbi Akiva, wants to give him a shiul. What's the shiul? I want to tell you my personal tshuva story. What is it? Hashem took back his millions? No, no, no. That didn't happen yet. But the Rabbi Akiva version... The Rabbi Akiva Tshuva story. Why? Because Talmidim, they know him as the rabbi. He's a rabbi for all these years. They don't know about his past. They don't have YouTube. So what are they? He starts telling him a story. He says, you know, 
You probably don't know, but I used to be a Ama Aritz, ignoramus. Yeah, they're thinking to themselves, yeah, probably a Bia Kiva. It's probably uh, one of the hidden Sadikim. So he probably didn't know as much Torah as he knows now. So that's why he calls himself an Ama Aritz. But in reality, he was probably like uh, born with perfect Midot, like Moshe Rabbeinu. He said, no, no. I was an Ama Aritz, I was a shepherd. It's like, ah, you see, see, he was a shepherd, and that's why he, he's not, he's talk, talking about, he's not saying like he was a, a uh, hater of Torah or anything like that. He was like a hidden tzaddik. He was, no, I was a shepherd, I didn't know anything. They didn't know how to live bit. So they say it among themselves, like, oh yeah, probably, okay, maybe he wasn't a scholar, but surely he didn't hate the Torah. And Rabbi Akiva says to them, you know what I used to think about? I used to think about when I was a shepherd with my sheep, with all types of animals, I used to think, who's going to bring me a Torah scholar so I could bite him like a donkey? One of the students says, Rabbi, you mean a dog, right? Rabbi Akiva says, no, you don't need to correct me. I thought... Give me a Torah scholar so I can bite him like a donkey because while a dog will bite the flesh and there's still going to be something left of that Torah scholar. I hated Talmidei Chachamim. I hated Torah scholars so much. I wanted to destroy them completely. So it seems like Rabotai, his students didn't know much until the story came. Why is he telling him this? Why is he telling his students that already see him like this great sage that he is? Why is he telling them is Hashem took back his millions version? Why? He says, first and foremost, you have to learn a few things, Rabutai. Anybody can do tshuva. Anyone can do tshuva. Anyone can do tshuva. As long as they're alive. That's number one. Number two, the only reason why I hated the rabbis, why I hated the Torah scholars, the only reason was because I was an Ama Aritz. I was ignorant of what the truth is. I was ignorant of what the Torah is. Meaning, the hatred that you see from one Jew to the next Maybe from jealousy at times, maybe because of uh, business reasons and so on. But the hatred that you see between the fools and the scholars is because of their lack of knowledge of how great the scholars really are. The hatred you see from heretics against the Gdolim is because the heretics are also stupid. They're also completely ignoramuses. They're also ameharatso. They don't even know the basics. They don't even know there's reward and punishment that's a foundation of Judaism. Why? They're so busy trying to pacify their audience in order to be popular. They're so busy trying to make everybody friendly and everybody like them. They don't have time to learn the real truth. So they hate those that speak the truth. They hate those that know the truth because they don't really know how great they are. They simply don't know. They have no capacity. And that's what Rabbi Akiva from Shemaim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted them to fix it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted Rabbi Akiva to fix this past mistake that he made when he was an ignoramus. He didn't know, so he hated the scholars. And therefore, later on, many years later on, 24 years later on, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends Rabbi Akiva to teach the halacha, to have fear of the Torah scholars, just like you fear God. Why? Because they're amazing. They're the ones that are beloved in the eyes of Hashem. They're the ones that are beloved in the eyes of Hashem. And there's a little hint of it all over the Torah. There's a little hint of it everywhere. But needless to say, a person that does not like the sages, does not like the Chachamim, likes to make fun of them, likes to completely distort the things that they're doing, it simply shows how ignorant they are. I'll give you a few examples. 
There was a video that came out some time ago during the uh, corona of them showing that there was diff- a gathering of different religious leaders, the Christian religious leaders, the Pope, and the guy from the Greek Orthodoxy of, of Christianity, uh, I believe uh, some uh, guy from Islam, and surely Arab Yitzchak Yosef, the Rishon Letzion, Arab Lao, the Rishon Letzion, they're all, in essence, praying at the same time. Now, those that respect the rabbis understood that even if they don't understand what they're looking at, understood, okay, the rabbi knows what he's doing. The rabbi knows what he's doing. Why? There's a reason why he is the biggest rabbi in the world. There's a reason. There's a reason why he's praying over there. Oh, I don't understand why. They have enough respect to know, okay, listen, doesn't look good to me that he's praying on the same place next to some pope, next to some idol worshiper. It doesn't make any sense. But I don't know enough to say anything about it. So they keep quiet. But then there's the arrogant that are ignorant at the same time. There's nothing worse than an arrogant person that's also ignorant. At least if you have something to be uh, arrogant about, at least there's something to talk about. But there's the arrogant that are ignorant, who automatically say, oh, look, he's praying right next to the Pope. Oh, he's an idol worshiper. You see, he's an idol worshiper. They're bad. They're Erevrav. They're this. And you say to yourself, Ribbono Shalom, not only you're calling the biggest rabbis in the world idol worshippers, not only you're calling the biggest rabbis in the world horrible names, but on top of it, you're publicizing it. On top of it, you're saying it out loud. There's literally nothing worse than an arrogant person that's ignorant. Nothing. Because those people... They make sure that their ignorance is publicized and they don't even realize that what they're doing is wrong. Now, of course, if we have the ideal situation, we want our big rabbis to pray with us, to pray with our communities. But if a person doesn't know, then the Gemara specifically says, if you see a tzaddik doing something that's wrong, it's a sin, automatically do not judge him in an unfavorable way. Why? Because surely he did tshuva already. If he's a Talmud Chacham, automatically assume he did tshuva. But if what if what you're looking at, you're not even sure what it is? How dare you assume the wrong? Now in this particular case, you have to understand a few things. Anyone that learns Torah, looks at that view, perhaps doesn't care for it. In other cases, looks at it as something normal. Why normal? Why doesn't care for it? Because you see this throughout all of Jewry, if you read the Gemara, if you read the history of Judaism, you see that the leaders of Am Yisrael had to go meet the leaders of the other nations for the sake of peace many times. Whether it was Rabbi Akiva, or it was a uh, uh, Rabbi Shimon, or it was a uh, other sages of recent memory, we constantly had to meet with other religions. We had to constantly have some type of representation in order to maintain peace. There's no question that what is happening today, there's nothing new about it. Now, as far as praying, halachically, if you look at the letter of the law, if you look at the Torah itself, there's nothing wrong with it. Why? The fact that you have an idol worshiper, Praying right next to you doesn't make your prayer any less. Doesn't make your prayer forbidden. He can go pray to a monkey for all you care. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. And if a person simply understood the halacha, knows that there is nothing wrong with it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Now, would we want the rabbis to be praying in our synagogues, in our our community? Surely. But sometimes the leaders have to do things for the sake of maintaining peace, for the sake of fulfilling a certain role as a leader, and so on. And sometimes, even if they don't want to do it, they have to do certain things. But a lot of people don't know Jewish history, don't know the, uh, the halacha, don't know anything. They simply start tarnishing the names of the sages, and then they're surprised that their life turns to garbage. Just like the Pasuk says in the name of Shlomo HaMelech, Ivelet Adam tesalev darko ve'al Adonai af libo. The stupidity of man will cause him to sin, and then they're upset at Hashem for punishing them. 
when a person makes fun of Hashem, when a person goes against the Torah, Kadosh Baruch Hu has a lot of patience, and many times he has patience to allow the person sometimes years before they do tshuva. Different people, different accounting. But when a person makes fun of Torah sages, when a person makes fun of the Gdolim, when a person makes fun of even a Torah scholar, an unknown Torah scholar, but nonetheless, someone that's a Talmud Chacham, a Kadosh Baruch Hu takes it personal. And a lot of times those people get punished severely, severely, and very quickly. And that's what people simply don't understand. When you see some of these things, you don't understand. If you're not a scholar, either be quiet or go to a Torah scholar to explain to you what's going on. Because in reality, there's nothing wrong with it. Simply, halachically, absolutely nothing wrong with it. Now, you're going to say, okay, thank you very much, halachically, but is something like this found in the Torah? Yes, it's found in the Torah also. I've told you guys the story of Eliyahu Navi. Eliyahu Navi. Zachur Letov had a battle against 900 prophets, of which only half of them showed up to the showdown of him against them. On one stage, all of Am Yisrael are over there, and they're all listening to everybody pray. Everybody pray. They're all praying to their idols. Eliyahu Navi is right next to them, on the same stage. And it's not one false god, not two false gods. Each one of them has a different idol. Each one of them is a different false prophet. And Eliyahu Navi is over there. And not only that, he helps them. He says, listen, looks like you guys are praying for a while to this God of yours, but he's not listening. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's tired. Maybe he's hard of hearing. Maybe somebody else is talking to them. Maybe we should wait a little longer for afternoon. And he waits and he waits and he mocks them. But nonetheless, he's there. Why? They could pray to Pikachu for all he cares. Doesn't mean anything. It has no value. Why? I'm praying to the one and only God. I'm praying to the one and only God. Now, why, how come we cannot go to a church? Why is it you forbidden to go to a church? Why is it not the same case for, let's say, a, a Ephraim Mirvis, Shem Rashaim Mirka from, from England, that goes to churches on a regular basis? Because that is halachically forbidden. You're not allowed to pray at a church because the place itself is a place of idolatry. Play, praying outside, praying in a synagogue, praying in some roof or some office. That's not a place of idolatry. You can pray next to the Pope himself if you want. But to pray or even walk into a church, that in itself, that in itself is a sin. Eliyahu Navi was, pray, was praying right next to over 400 idol worshippers right next to them on top of the mountain. Nothing wrong with it. Why? Simple. He knows the halacha. But what happens is, Rabotai, is that many times people, they're so foolish, they know such, so little, that they're forced to hate the greatest people on earth. They're forced to hate the greatest people on earth. Why? Because these great people do a lot of things, and they don't understand them. And to them, they want to be zealous with their limited, you know, $3 knowledge. They just did tshuva four days ago. They just started keeping Shabbat this week. They just started learning something and they're not even sure what they're reading. But they want to go against the biggest rabbis in the world or they want to go against the Torah scholar. What happens? They're led to a place that unfortunately is very hard to come out of. Why? Because the Mishnah says... That one of the things that takes a person out of this world is jealousy. One of the things that takes a person out of this world is jealousy. And a person that's ignorant, automatically, by default, if they don't know how to appreciate the Chachamim, by default, they hate the Chachamim. Where is that? In the same Gemara that we just talked about. The same Gemara, Masech Psachim, says the following. Says the following when it's talk when it's referring to who should you marry off your daughter to? Who should you marry off your daughter to? Masechet Psachim, page 49a says, The rabbis taught that a man should always be prepared to sell all that he owns so that, it, it, that he can marry off his daughter to a Torah scholar. For then, even if he dies or he's exiled and is unable to raise his children, He's assured that his sons will become Torah scholars themselves. 
That's how important it is for your, you to marry off your daughter to a Torah scholar. Give all of your money, 100 million or 1 million or whatever you have, just to make sure that, that your daughter marries a Torah scholar. Further, the rabbis teach. In 49b, a man should always be prepared to sell all he owns so that he can marry off his daughter to a Torah scholar. Why? If, if he cannot find, if he cannot find a, uh, a, a um, oh, that he can marry a, a daughter of a Torah scholar. So if he's looking for a wife, he should marry a daughter of a Torah scholar. If he can't find a daughter of a Torah scholar, he should marry the daughter of one of the great people of the generation. If he cannot find a daughter of one of the great people of the generation, he should marry off the daughter of one of the community leaders. And if he cannot find a daughter of one of the community leaders, he should marry off the daughter of one of the charity collectors. And if he cannot find one of the daughters of the charity collectors, he should marry the daughter of one of the school teachers. Why all these descriptions? Why? Because under no condition should he marry the daughter of an Ama Aritz, a person that is ignorant in Torah. You should never marry a, a, a person that's ignorant in Torah. Why? Because there's a problem with those people. When they're ignorant of Torah and they're obviously they don't have respect for the Torah. If they have respect for the Torah and they're ignorant, then to teach them is like you are they're uh, becoming partners with God. But if they're haters of Torah, if they are making fun of the Torah, then these people, the Chachamim say they're like vermin. The people that are ignorant, they're like vermin, and their wives are like insects. And the rabbi said that it's forbidden for an Ama'aretz to eat meat. For it says in the Torah that the laws of the animal and the bird, this is the Torah, this is the law, which from there we learn that anyone that is occupied with studying Torah is allowed to eat meat but anyone that's uh, doesn't is not occupied with Torah is not allowed to eat meat that's how unfavorably a ignoramus is viewed in the Torah and furthermore the Chachamim teach that if anyone marries off his daughter to an Amaretz it's as if he tied her up and put her in front of the lion because just like a lion attacks and prays, the, uh, uh, devours his prey without shame, that Amaretz, since he does not have any Torah, does not have any wisdom, does not have any shame, he's going to cohabit with the, uh, with the daughter without shame. In public, in this and that. Who would want to do that to his daughter? And Rabbi Eliezer says that the pre- people that are ignorant of Torah they hate the Talmidei Chachamim so much that if it wasn't for business reasons they would simply kill all of the religious people well you see this today that many times you see that a lot of times the non-religious people want to go into the kosher business but this is why it's always an obligation to have a rabbi on premises in a super kosher supermarket or a kosher restaurant that has meat has to be a rabbi on premises, somebody that keeps the Torah and mitzvot. Why? Because if the owner is not Shomer Torah and mitzvot, you have a very, very serious problem. And unfortunately, today this happens where people are trying to manipulate the system in different ways in order to get ownership of the uh, kosher stores. And you'd ask yourself, why would a non-religious Jew want to go into a kosher uh, uh, supermarket or into a kosher restaurant? Go sell pig. Go sell uh, bats. Go do something else. Why do you dafka want to do it? Now, many times, it's because they're looking for the opportunity to take advantage of the religious people. I know of a few cases firsthand. Firsthand, there's one particular rasha merusha that is constantly looking to go into the kosher restaurant business. Constantly looking to go into the kosher restaurant business, but he himself does not keep Shabbat. Now, I spoke to somebody to tell him, listen, He's not going to get kashrut unless he keeps Shabbat. Why can't he keep Shabbat? Oh, you know, he's young, he's this, he's that. So, well, they're not going to give him kashrut. They're not going to give him the kosher certificate if he doesn't keep Shabbat. It's like, yeah, but he's actually asking me 
Now, if I could go partners with him, and I told the person that I talked to, listen, under no condition do you go into business with this person. Under no condition do you go into business with this person. This person is a Mechalel Shabbat. You cannot be the face of the place if this guy is your partner. Why? I said, listen, this guy's been trying to fool the kashrut for already a year to give him the kashrut meaning that for him he hates the torah and hashem so much that he refuses to keep shabbat in order to get his business started like he could have already started his business a year ago had he just simply started keeping shabbat but he hates the torah so much he hates hashem so much that he rather finagle around and find some sucker to be the face of the restaurant that has a keeper on so he can go in front of the rabbanut and tell him listen i want to get the uh, kosher restaurant certificate he'd rather do that hold up his whole business for a year than to keep shabbat that's how evil he is so he asked me what, what why does that make him evil i said listen if he's not willing to keep shabbat chachamim say his food is not kosher why because obviously there's something wrong here if he's willing to hold up his entire business for a whole year a whole year is a lot of time to hold up your business a whole year is willing to hold up his business but dafka insists on being in the kosher business that already shows that he has evil intentions why because he knows these kosher people they want to keep all types of things they're fanatic about their torah they're fanatic about their kashrut so if i have a kosher stamp they're gonna eat whatever i give them now I could tell him it's kosher, but I could go buy a donkey. I could go buy a pig. I could go buy a, a, a horse. I could go buy a cow from the Arabs. I could do whatever I want. Once it's cooked, no one can tell if it's kosher or not. No one can tell if it's kosher or not. Now, of course, there's a huge monetary difference here. Why? Because if I buy the, uh, the kosher steak, it's going to cost me 15 bucks a pound. If I buy the non-kosher, $1.50. That means that by default, I can outsell everybody, all my competition, and still make a profit. This is the mentality of the Rishayim. That's why they're not allowed to eat meat. That's why they're not allowed to cook your meat. Why? Because they seriously hate the Torah scholars and the Torah people. Now, Chachamim further says that anyone who engages in Torah, in front of an Amaretz, it's like as if he cohabited in front of him, in front of, uh, in front of him with his own wife. Meaning that a person that doesn't like Torah doesn't also like to hear Torah. Why it makes him jealous? Because he knows that he can never be called a tzaddik. He can never be called a chacham, even if he has a billion dollars. With all of the knowledge that he has about medicine, all the knowledge that he has about Wall Street, and all the knowledge that he has about everything else, no one will ever view him in the same level as this Chacham. If you ask any normal person, if you were driving in a, and you broke down in the middle of the highway in the middle of the night, pitch dark, and you have a, to change a tire, you don't have a way to change a tire, who do you want to pull over and help you? Someone that looks like the, uh, the, uh, the bald one that looks like a Nazi but converts a thousand people on the beach? Or do you want someone that looks like a Jew? Who do you want to pull over and fix your car? That one that makes fun of uh, the sages and the Chachamim? Or you want someone that looks like a Jew? Who do you want to help you? Surely a normal person will understand. Surely I don't want someone that looks like a Nazi to help me even if he's better at fixing. Why? Right. I'm scared to my life. He looks, uh, he comes to my car and I think he's going to kill me. He's going to think he's going to kill me. But someone that looks like a respectable Jew, you see, oh, this is what I want. This, uh, that's, <laughs> that's not scary. Everybody understands this. Everybody understands the, the, this logic. No one wants some secular avaryan gangster to be the one that helps the middle of the middle of the night. Nobody wants that. So every time an ignoramus hears or sees a real scholar speak automatically it develops hatred how much hatred then the Gemara finalizes the section with the following the hatred of the Amaratzot feel towards the Torah scholars is greater than the hatred that the nations of the world feel towards Israel 
and their wives hate the Torah scholars even more than they do. Now, this doesn't really need much of an explanation, but we'll explain it anyway, just to show you what this means. The hatred that the people that make fun of Torah scholars, even if they themselves call themselves rabbis, that hatred comes because of ignorance. They simply don't know what a Torah scholar really is, therefore they make fun of them. Just like Rabbi Akiva did not know what Torah scholars were until he became one, therefore he made fun of them and hated them. That hatred is not a normal hatred. In fact, it is the greatest hatred that exists in the world. That hatred that people that make fun of the Torah sages have. The hatred that the people that hate Torah scholars have. The hatred that people that have against Avrechim have is even greater than the greatest anti-semitics in the world and the wives of those people hate the torah scholars even more and i could assure you that right this moment if one of these haters is watching this lecture with their wife the wife is saying right now he's right he's right i hate him more than even my husband does why because it's in them it's simply in them. And this Rabotai is not something, oh, let, this is Rabbi Akiva. This is Gemara. This is our Torah, and we see this throughout the generations. We see the Zionists try to kill just as many Jews as the Nazis did. When they had an opportunity to save a million Jews of Hungary, they chose not only not to save them, they chose to sabotage the mission that could have saved the million Jews of Hungary. And therefore, the last million of the six million were murdered by the Nazis, but only because of the Zionists. Till this day, the Torah haters come in all shapes and sizes. They come as sometimes as people that pretend to be rabbis. They come sometimes as people that pretend to be good people. They don't come to you with horns. They don't come to you with a frown. In fact, many times they come to you with loving words that they accept you as you are, no matter what you are. And unfortunately, Rabotai, the way you see who's the Torah haters is whether their behavior coincides with the description of those that are beloved by Hashem or those that are not beloved by Hashem. Now, how do we know that Akadosh Baruch Hu HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself tells us specifically that we have to love the rabbis in order to really love him. That very same verse that Rabbi Akiva mentioned, Et Hashem Elokecha Tira, that verse has all the secrets. First off, that verse is chapter 6, verse 13. 613. One person that I know from years ago named Michael Rodriguez told me, look, this verse talks about that you have to fear Hashem in order to follow his 613 commandments. It was a very nice chidush, very nice insight. To further elaborate on that insight, to further elaborate on that insight, we see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that you have to fear him. But Rabbi Akiva says, Et Adonai Elohecha Tira. Not just fear your God, but fear the rabbis. Fear your God and fear the rabbis. Which means, when you have fear of the Almighty, you'll be able to observe the 613 mitzvot. But in order to keep the 613 mitzvot properly, it begins with fear of the rabbis if you want to keep the 613 mitzvot you have to fear hashem but if you want to know how to keep those 600 mitzvot the right way it all starts with fearing of the rabbis the torah scholars that's in essence what's hidden why because those torah scholars are the ones that are beloved by hashem that's who the chazonish is talking about those Torah scholars are who's beloved by Hashem. It's not the people that tell you that Hashem loves everybody. 
It's not the people that tell you that Hashem doesn't judge anyone harshly. It's not those people. Those people are the flatterers. Those people are the haters of Hashem. Those people that are megalim panim la Torah. That they are distorting the face of the Torah. Distorting the face of the Torah to be something that it's not. To be something that's considered an abomination. And one of the main ways that you see that they do it is they literally do not provide ver- uh, any quotes to what they say or they completely distort and lie altogether. Or best yet, most obvious, is they fight against, in public or in private, those people that are saying the truth. This is why the Chazonish told us here that it's important for a person to know how to identify who is a Torah scholar and understand that that Torah scholar is the most beloved by Hashem. He is the best of the best. There is no better than him. There's simply no better than him. But a person that doesn't know and is not necessarily at a level or at a point of their life that they're able to commit so much to become a Torah scholar themselves, like Rabbi Akiva did, how can they fall in love with such a person? First, you should learn from them. Now, what if you can't learn from them? What if you're not able to learn from them? If they don't teach, if they just listen and they're in a uh, kola, but they don't teach, how can you love Torah scholars in general? Simply learn about Torah scholars and who they are. Learn how great they are. A person that is a real Torah scholar, there is specific laws in the Torah that tell us of how we need to treat them. That you have to be careful how you speak to them. Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu takes a personal issue with people that go against them. Furthermore, if a person knows a lot of Torah, knows a lot of books, but is a faker, meaning that he knows a lot of information, but he has no Yerat Shemayim, then that very same Shulchan Aruch says, now he turns from being the greatest of society to being the worst of society. You're not allowed to do business with him. You're not allowed to socialize with him. Meaning, he can know a thousand books by heart. But if he makes fun of mitzvot, if he uh, simply makes fun of the sages, if he simply minimizes things, even if he knows a lot, but he has no yirat shamaim, that person becomes the worst of society, meaning he's even worse than an Ama Aretz. He's even worse than an Ama Aretz. And if those people understood what is the difference between that person and a person that's a Torah scholar, they understand that it's, it's a world apart. It's not a small difference. It's a world apart. It's not that if he just acquired Yirat Shemaim, automatically he'll get to become a Torah scholar. It takes a lot more. I'll give you an example. There was one Talmud Chacham that came to Rav Oyerbach for a blessing. Why a blessing? He said, this Talmud Chacham is an Avrech, an Akolel, not multimillionaire or anything, but a situation came to his hand where there was an issue of life risk. Another Jew was in a situation of life risk unless a million dollars was collateralized and paid to save this person from life risk. This Talmud Chacham stopped learning and took the responsibility on himself to pay the million or million shekels. Now, he thought that first we got to take this guy out of life risk and then I'll get the money. He figured the community will help him. He got the guy out of life risk and now he has to come up with the money. He comes to the community to try to collect five shekels, 10 shekels, 30 cents, eight shekels. And he realizes, I'm not going to get the money from this. So he comes to Rav Oyerbach, Rav Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach, for a blessing. And he tells the rabbi the story. And Rav Oyerbach gets upset with him. He says, wait a minute. You took a million shekel responsibility who told you that you're allowed to do such a thing you're you have a family he says no 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 Kvod Arav. i understood that there's a life risk here it's a life risk here and i had to do it he said yeah but who told you that you could take such a risk 
He says, well, Kvodarav, the Allah says, if you have it, you can, you, can, you can take it. So I evaluated that I have a house that's worth just about a million shekels. But the problem is that when I made the commitment, that's what I thought it's going to cost. What ended up happening is that by the time he got freed and everything, it cost a little bit more. So there's about 100,000, 150,000 difference. So that's what I'm collecting. That's what I'm collecting. I'm not collecting the million. I already have it. I'm going to sell my house. I'm just collecting the 150,000 that was extra above what I have. At that moment, Av Oyerbach was shaken. He said, wait, you're telling me that you're going to go and sell your house to go save this Jew that you don't even know? And Avrak says, wouldn't you do the same thing? That's a Talmud Chacham. He has a mitzvah. He has a mitzvah. And he's willing to do anything for it. He's willing to do anything for it. He's not just somebody that reads books and watch YouTube videos. Many times people think they became scholars because they're expert at watching YouTube videos. They became expert scholars that can go against the big rabbis because they know how to read a few words. People have no concept, no concept of what real Torah scholars are. Many times I laugh when people make fun of rabbis in a way that I understand automatically how little these people know. How little do they know that if you give them a real sefer that's a response of one of the sages, they wouldn't survive a single paragraph. Forget a page. A single paragraph, they would not be able to manage what it actually means. If I go to my library and I bring them one of Rabbi Ephraim's responses, they would not be able to explain to me a single paragraph what it actually says. Forget about what's the right or what's the wrong. That's worlds apart. I'm talking about they would not be able to interpret what he's actually saying. And not just Rabbi Ephraim. You go to Rabbi Vadya, you go to Yabiya Omer, you go to any of the Sfarim, you open a Sefer, you show it to them, they simply would not be able to understand and explain to you what is actually being said. But yet they have the audacity to go make fun of the Rishon Lezion, to make fun of big Talmidei Chachamim, to go make fun of people that speak in the name of the sages. They make fun. Why? Because they're ignorant. They're ignorant. And their ignorance creates the hateness that is beyond, the hatred that is beyond anti-Semitism. Beyond Nazis hating Jews. That's how much the ignoramus hates the scholar. Simple. End of discussion. It's something that is even beyond their control. Because they don't even know what a Torah scholar is. If it punched them in the face. They don't know what it sounds like. They don't know what it looks like. Because all they know is that they need to become more liked. They need to become more appreciated, more recognized, more popular. The last thing a Torah scholar is looking for is any of those things. Any of those things. Anyone that's looking to become more popular, by default there's something wrong with his scholarship. Anyone that's looking to say things because it'll create likes, automatically there's something wrong with a scholarship. Why? It just simply doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter if you're popular or not. It doesn't matter if you're liked or not. Why? You're doing it for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the sake of Torah. Who cares if they like, they don't like, that's HaKadosh Baruch Hu's hands. Kadosh Baruch who's going to decide whether you succeed or not? But when you see people making fun of the Torah, making fun of the sages, making fun of Abrechim, making fun of Talmidei Yeshiva, the only conclusion you should get to is, wow, they're so ignorant. You don't need to get upset as far as, oh, I want to hurt this person or I hate this person. Seriously, 
there's not even much to hate they already are hating themselves so much with their own behavior that it's a moot point already they're already creating so much damage for themselves nothing else you can do to make it worse i know people that have gone against Talmidei Chachamim and people that say the truth and i saw with my own eyes how much of a disaster their life has turned into literally right away one guy spoke against somebody literally within a matter of uh, six months got uh, testicular cancer six months another guy one of his kids died another guy his wife divorced him he's still alone three four years later but if you look at his Facebook page he's still making YouTube videos against the rabbis not realizing that his loneliness his misery his failure in his work him getting fired from every job that he ever had doesn't say anything wrong with it still makes videos against the rabbis still makes videos divorce failure bankruptcy cancer literally like their their life turns to like complete garbage and they don't have the intuition to pinpoint when the fall began why because they didn't learn enough to know how much Hashem hates people like them that make fun of scholars so they don't know enough to know not only how to deal with the scholar but to know that their demise that's happening in their life is because they're going against the scholar the reason why she left you is because Akadosh Baruch Hu says no one's gonna like you you make fun of my kids I'll make sure nobody likes you not even the one that said I do wife body bank account jobs and you literally see their lives go to garbage garbage and I've seen this with my own eyes with multiple people and you don't even know what to tell these people because literally they're not clever enough to see what they're doing wrong and they just continue doing it even more they continue to do it even more arrogantly and if you ever tell them anything they think that you're crazy and literally it becomes a lost cause very few people can return from such a thing because it becomes more and more personal for them they start blaming the scholars for all of their losses they start blaming the scholars for all of their misery even though it has no actual real uh, connection aside from the spiritual connection that Hashem is making it but it's not the rabbi that took you your wife from you it's not the rabbi that took your uh, job from you it's not the rabbi that called the insurance company and told him to fire you the rabbi doesn't even know what, that you're alive aside from the times that you send him videos that you're making fun of him but that's what happens that's what happens Rabotai. you see people literally mamash just dying a slow vicious death with their own hands it's like they're eating poison but they're expecting somebody else to die and I have no doubt in my mind that each and every single one of those people that are going against the Torah publicly will have the same exact end I've seen in my own eyes those people that have done it I've seen it I see it and unfortunately I know I'm going to continue seeing it because the world as we know it has a lot of ignorance more ignorance today perhaps than any other time in history even though it's a generation where there's more access to information than any other time in history the ignorance today is running rampant and if people don't take their neshama seriously their eternity seriously and they continue looking for people that are simply going to pacify them and simply going to allow them to continue behaving inappropriately like they already had then they and their teachers will have a very very bad end in this world and the next this is why Rabbi Akiva says you have to understand those tell me those tell me they are who you need to fear along with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. why they are the builders of the world not just your kids they're the builders of the world you say in your prayer which is part of the oral Torah what's banaich banaich is your children 
These Torah scholars and Atras could be your children. But they're Bonaich. They're the ones that are already around you. The world exists because of them. They're the ones that are building. And this Rabotai, our sages teach us this in many places in the Torah. In four tractates in the Gemara, it completes with this lesson of how the Torah scholars are the builders. Masechet Brachot, Masechet Nazir, Masechet Yevamot, and Masechet Kritut. To remember that, just think of the acronym Banaich. Banaich, Bet, Nun, Yud, Chafsufit. So Bet for Brachot, Nun for Nazir, uh, Yud for Yevamot, and Chaf for Kritut. Four tractates complete with this lesson that the Torah scholars are the builders. They're the builders. Sometimes those builders are multimillionaires along with being Torah scholars. Sometimes those builders make 500 bucks a month. Either way, you have to fear them like you fear God. Why? That, those are the most beloved. Those are the most beloved. You want to call yourself an Orthodox Jew? You better start respecting the scholars. You want to be a real Baal Tshuva? You better start respecting the scholars. Perhaps take some time and do something in order to respect the scholars on a regular basis. Don't just learn from the previous scholars. Respect the ones that already exist. Don't treat them like they're your friends. They're not your friends. Mishnah Navot says that you have, you have to be careful from Chachamim because when they bite, they bite like a fox. It hurts. What does it mean to bite? If you insult the Talmud Chacham, the bite hurts. Not from the Chacham, from Hashem. Hashem takes the business of Chachamim very seriously. Now, of course, you want to make fun of it? You can do whatever you want. Everybody has choice. They like to call it free choice, but it's not free. It's choice. Each one of us has choice. One day, we'll have to pay for that choice. And we'll see it's not free. Sometimes we'll get paid for that choice. We'll also see it's not free. We actually get paid for it. We have paid reward for it. Sometimes we get paid punishment for our choices. Each person needs to make their decisions with some thought behind it. If you are going to go into a business, you're not just a newbie where you're just going to start something without learning anything. You're going to see what did everybody else that built the business do anyone else that you know anyone else that you could read about and you're not going to read just about the success stories you're going to read about failures so you don't repeat the same mistakes the more clever you are the more information you read and you learn about the reason why people succeed and the reason why people fail and the more you try to emulate those that had the ultimate success Chazonis teaches us here, if you want to be one of the beloved people in the world, if you want to be one of the greatest people that the world has, first you have to recognize who they are and start emulating them. Start respecting them. Start appreciating them. Start doing everything you possibly can to be on their good side. And perhaps you'll have the merit to become one of them or maybe have a son become one of them or have a daughter marry one of them surely the more you understand who they are and more you connect yourself to them the better your chances are making fun of them disagreeing with them publicly thinking you know more than them no profit will ever come out of such a transaction. In fact, only a detrimental loss. We don't want to come to this world just to lose. We want to win. Because as we learned today from the Ramban, and also the Rambam, and also Rabbi Yonah, and the Gemara, and Masechet Avot, and the Chumash, the talk about Genom being eternity, we see that the loss is not always a temporary loss. 
In fact, in the case of mocking the Talmidei Chachamim, we can bring ourselves to the situation of having a permanent and eternal loss. The gain is extraordinary. The loss is eternal. Choose wisely. And Be'ezot Hashem will continue to learn together, continue to get closer and closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and His Chachamim, so we could maybe perhaps one day become one of them. Perhaps one day have our kids marry them, have our kids become them. Either way, become part of those people that are beloved by Hashem and become part of those people that Hashem says, those are bonaich, those are your builders. Bauch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen. אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שערכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בשלות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, יזכירו ויצליחו, יזכירו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. חזק אותו בשביל. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. תעבירו מה שבירכתי אותו. כן. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. כן.